And we are live. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Level Up Live. I am Dr. Sharita gaskins tillett I am your host. This is where we feature the remarkable accomplishments of women physicians, both inside and outside of the exam room. So I'm so happy to have you with us this evening. If you are joining us live, please say hi in the comments. If you have questions for our guests, please post them in the comments. If you're watching the replay, hashtag replay. And if you have questions, you ask questions too. I will definitely get them to our sp very special guest. And I'm so excited to have her with us tonight. I'm just going to give a few more seconds for folks to come in and then we'll get started. So our guest this evening is Dr. Monique May, who is also known as Physician in the Kitchen. Dr. Monique is the author of the Amazon best-selling books, Meal Masters, Your Simple Guide to Modern Day Meal Planning, and Doc, Fix My Plate, The Physician in the Kitchen's Prescriptions for Your Healthy Meal Makeover. Dr. Monique is passionate about using her social platform to educate people on the health benefits of plant-based foods while showing them ways to save time in the kitchen. Dr. Monique graduated with honors from Temple University School of Medicine and then obtained a master's in healthcare administration from George Washington University. She went on to complete her residency in family medicine in Charlotte, North Carolina, where she was named Outstanding Resident of the Year in 1999. A member of the American Academy of Family Physicians, she has received accolades as Physician of the Year in 2019. Dr. Monique also trained at a vegan culinary school. Welcome, Dr. Monique. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharita, and, and hello to everyone watching, and happy Women's Month, History Month to you. Yes, and this is also, what did I see today? Is it um, National Nutrition Month as well? I it believe might. it is. I think it is. I believe and it's it's National Nutrition Month as well, because I thought it was fortuitous that I had you on during Women's History Month. Well, I mean, all of my guests are women, but but that it was also, you know, nutrition. Nutrition, uh, exactly. Nutrition and, it's that, and it's pie day for the for the math nerds out there. I'm one. Yes. It's a <laughs> national pie day, P-I day as well. <laughs> Lots of things to celebrate this month. Yes. So Dr. Monique, tell us about you. So well, first of all, you know, fellow GW person, I did my residency at GW. So I just want to give that okay. GW shout out. Yes. Um, I, I feel like I keep getting guests that have been in places where I've been. Um, so there's that. So tell us about your journey through medicine. You know, what made you choose? What made you go into medicine? What made you choose family medicine? Well, let's, let's start there. Okay, sure. Well, yes, as you said, my name is Dr. Monique May, and I am known as the physician in the kitchen, and I help busy households enjoy healthy plant-based eating without impacting their hectic schedules. My journey to medicine was, I, I really think it was, you know, destined. Um, I was actually born with vocal cord polyps. Uh, I was diagnosed at a year of age. My mom was very astute. She noticed I didn't cry as loudly as other babies. Most people would have been happy about that. Yeah. Um, but she took me in to get checked out. And I had papilloma, uh, which are like warty, warty growths on my vocal cords and had to have them removed multiple times. Between the age of one and 12, my mother says she lost count after 100 surgeries. So I was in and out the hospital, in and out, in and out. So there was that background. And then in ninth grade, I took uh, my science class. We studied the human body and we, we learned, we studied the heart, skin, I want to say the eye and the kidney. And I was hooked. I was yeah. hooked. And I was like, I need to learn more about this. So I, I pretty much knew then that I wanted to become a physician. I wanted to go to medical school. Um, and so after college, I, I went on to Temple, as you mentioned, and then um, went on to do family medicine. Now, when I went to med school, I actually wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. I was going to, I had visions of myself running through the airport with a, with hearts and coolers, you know, jumping on airplanes. And then I did my surgery rotation and realized I didn't like surgery so much. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, you know, that makes it a little difficult. <laughs> that was a challenge. And then I did an OBGYN rotation. And the part of my OBGYN rotation that I liked the most was GYN, specifically in the clinic. I didn't like the surgery part, but I loved the clinic part. I loved being able to sit and talk with my patients. And so after that was family medicine. And so all these rotations were just kind of like dominoes falling. Yeah. 
And um, and I, I I fell in love with with family medicine. I had some really good um, instructors, and who really showed me their passion about caring for the family, right, from the womb yeah. to the tomb, yeah. and so um, and everything in between. And so that's where I was bitten by the family medicine bug, and have, and really enjoyed it. I think it's so interesting how you know most of us are either surgeons or not surgeons, right? <laughs> There's yeah, not a I, was a surgeon. I thought I had that surgeon mentality. There's not a lot of, a lot of in between. You no. Know? no, 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 no. <laughs> That's cool. So, so now, okay. So, do you still practice? I don't. I left clinical practice at the end of 2018. So, about a year and a half or so before the the pandemic took over. Um, and I've been in administration since then. So, what made you leave uh, clinical practice? Well, I practiced for over 20 years and uh, 15 years, uh, 15 of those years were in primary care, family medicine. Uh, I worked in a variety of, I had my own practice. I worked in a group, uh, hospital, nursing homes, you name it. I had pretty much done it except for maybe correctional medicine. Um, and then I, uh, the last five years was, uh, I was a medical director for an urgent care occupational medicine office. And um, quite honestly, I got to the point where I got tired of not being valued and not being appreciated. Mm, okay. uh, the day that, that the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, um, I was working in the clinic and some of my colleagues, the other office, the, the water or electricity or something happened and they had to come over to our clinic to see patients. Well, I went to lunch. I come back, they've left and left me with a clinic full of patients to see by myself. Wow. I was like, who does that? Yeah. And, and there were other things going on in the background. And that I made that decision that day to submit my resignation. <laughs> And so you knew you were done with clinical medicine. I, at that point, point, I think I kind of was. I was like, you know, I'm not enjoying it as much. I, I enjoyed the patient, again, the patient aspect, sure. but the other stuff I wasn't enjoying. And I didn't want to be that person. Um, you know, we talk about physician burnout and so forth yeah. and how that, how that shows up. I didn't want to get to that. And I was like, you know, I, no, I, I have options. I have options. I'm going to pursue them. So. So how, tell me, how did you know you had options? What what informs you of these options? I, I'm, I'm from New York. I've got a I got, I got that hustler kind of mentality. Okay. I've always believed in multiple having multiple revenue streams, yeah. and so um, I had I had worked in administration um, before uh, as one of my side hustles, and I had wanted to work from home. And it just it just really all aligned. But as a physician, I mean, I'm, I was fortunate, you know, I, I have an MD, I also have an MHA. Um, and I just I didn't see that I didn't have options. I it, it to me, it wasn't I've never been one to like be stagnant. And if I my time is the most valuable, I mean, it's the same yeah. for everyone, but I'm I'm really you know, if you're wasting my time or if I'm not getting to where I need to be because of whatever I'm doing with you or in this situation, I need to go. And so um, I've just always kind of had that. I think I've just always kind of had that mentality of knowing like this is not right for me. This is not serving my spirit well anymore. Yeah. Let, me, let me look for the exit. And so it was kind of along those lines. I, I think that's wonderful because, you know, I talk to a lot of people who don't feel like they have options. Um, you know, they feel like there's only one way to do medicine. Well, only one way to have a career. So let's not even say do medicine. You know, once you've gone to medical school, that there's just one way to kind of do your career or maybe several within the same um, family of ways. But I, I admire that you realized that you had options and that you were brave enough to pursue those options, to pivot and pivot into what? So it's um, again, you know, it's just so funny how opportunities kind of present themselves. So my my passion now, my my baby, my my real baby is a freshman in college at North Carolina A and T. So my other baby, my business, my brand, physician in the kitchen, um, is where my passion is. And in my spare moments, in addition to working my full time job that pays the bills, I'm I'm steady grinding on on my brand. Um, 
just a little bit more kind of a, how I came to be physician in the kitchen. Yeah. I, I, I remember, you know, I'm a child of the seventies, had the little easy bake oven. Um, so I've always kind of been in the kitchen or kitchen adjacent, right? My mom cooks, my, both my grandmothers. And I was um, extremely close to my maternal grandmother. Um, I grew up in New York and she was there. My parents were from Alabama, but she would come up, you know, or we would visit. This is before FaceTime and all that, Zoom. And so we would see each other as, as often as we could. I'm the oldest granddaughter, so I had a special place. Of and you know, of course, and I, sometimes I have to remind my cousins of that. But um, <laughs> but so we would, we were extremely close. And so she would make this, this um, simple thing called sweet bread. And so people from Alabama may know what I'm talking about but it's just basically plain yellow cake there's no icing no nothing but it's just it's plain cake and it was just the best it was the best one when she would make that for me either when we were together or she would send it to me I you couldn't tell me anything that my grandma made me this so I just felt so loved and cherished and so through the years, though, you know, I could see the toll that her health, that her her weight, her smoking, her high blood pressure was taking on her health. And shortly after I graduated medical school, she actually had a massive stroke and died at the age of 67. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, was, I was I was devastated. You know, I just was like, how could she be gone already? She was so young. So kind of after processing that anger at her, I was angry. I was like, you know, you you robbed me. It was a little selfish, yeah. right? You robbed me of death of you. Um, but then I, I took uh, the memories of her, the, the smell of the vanilla from the, you know, the the the, the sweet bread, um, and just kind of married that with my desire to help people. You know, when I was practicing, I would do this one on one, right, in the exam room, coaching and, and advising people. Well, why not combine those and expand that to serve a larger audience? And so that's why now talk about a plant-based diet uh, because we know the benefits of it, of that. And um, just trying to get people to see how they can incorporate. I'm not saying you have to become vegan overnight, but at least start to think about how can I, you know, incorporate more plants uh, and start to just to really be, be purposeful and mindful about what I'm eating. So when did you become vegan? So before I answer that question, I, I want to level set real quick because there's vegan and there's plant-based. And so I want- they're not the same. They're not the same, okay. and I want to I want to um, explain that to your listeners because it, it's a common um, uh, you know mistake or a common thing that people do. So plant based means that, that that's referring to just your diet. That means you eat predominantly plants, you know, v- fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, grains, all that. You may also eat some meat, some chicken, some fish. But usually, the majority of your diet is going to be plant based okay. versus vegan which is no animal product. Okay. That means no honey, um, you know, and, and actually it can extend if they're veganism, which is more of a lifestyle that can include not going to things like zoos and aquariums because those are affecting animals or they may not wear leather or even silk because it's made by worms. So vegan can have a much more strict um, connotation. So I kind of call myself vegan-ish because every now and then I'm a piece of fish. Sure. Um, but for, the, for the most part, okay. I am. I am plant based, and that okay, was, talk to me about this vegan ish because that sounds like that. That's maybe something I could manage to do. There you go. So vegan ish is just where you eat the majority of your of your meal of your food is going to be plant based. Uh, I went to an event Saturday. I had some salmon. Before that, I can't tell you the last time I had a piece of salmon. So because I don't believe in eliminating just everything. Like I'm not. I'm not that person that says you can never eat bread. You can never eat this. You can never. I, that's not how I live. That's not how I advise or coach people to do. So if you want a piece of meat, you every now and then you want to eat a piece of meat, so be it. For me, I was never a big red meat eater, so that wasn't hard to let go. Um, I like playing around with substitutes, finding things that kind of replace things I'm accustomed to. So part of that of the journey is fun for me. So when I turned uh, 50 in 2020, so like three months into the pandemic, May of 2020, I turned 50. And... Um, I was like, wow, you okay, you know, well, half a century down, what's gonna, what's the next half gonna look like? And so that's kind of when the book started coming together, I started writing the book, or at least thinking about it. Um, and then going to v- a vegan culinary school um, really kind of helped put all those pieces together. So it's just, just a little bit of, of my life's experience. But what really pushed you more into that plant-based arena? Is there something that you noticed with your, your personal health? Did you have 
a particular health goal that that made you, uh, you know, begin to to move in that direction? You know, I've I've been fortunate. I've never really had an issue with with weight, so I didn't have to you know really think about that. I do have high blood pressure, so I've, I'm always salt aware of my salt intake. Um, for me, I do have arthritis, and I, I feel like you know if you eat less inflammatory foods, mm -hmm. that may help with joint pain. Um, last year or earlier this year, when I got my cholesterol and my lipid panel done my numbers were amazing. Like, I mean, they went to, they half, they were half of what they were before I went plant-based. Um, my good, my good cholesterol went up, my bad cholesterol went down, my total cholesterol went down. So just in general, you know, those things, but I didn't, I wasn't really trying to address something per se. I just, um, you know, you watch these documentaries about what's in the food, what's in the meat sources, and you're like, ah, yeah. Um, so it can be kind of scary. So, you know, you like you want to minimize that, um, getting away from all those processed foods. Well, then kind of what's left, you know, whole foods, which tend to be plant based. So right. we do have a question in the chat, um, which is how do you advise patients who have issues with bloating and have been advised to do a FODMAP diet? That's a great question. Um, and, and let me, and I always forget to do this. Uh, my disclaimer. So this is, uh, this information is general. It's not meant to treat, diagnose, cure, or prevent any diseases. And I certainly recommend, excuse me, certainly recommend you speak with your physician or uh, first before doing any of these recommendations. Um, but bloating can be caused by a variety of things. And so, you know, you you definitely want to get it checked out, particularly if it's new, if you're female. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to let Dr. Sharita, the OB, kind of talk about that. But there are things we get concerned about when we hear yeah. people say bloating. And so I would first and foremost make sure there's, you know, the, your intestines are okay. If you're female, you know, your ovaries, all that stuff's okay. Um, and then talk with your doctor about certain diets like FODMAP or, you know, if they need to refer you to a dietitian and things like that. Sometimes bloating can be so as simple as drinking soda, chewing gum, um, sugar substitutes like xylitol, things like that. Those can cause excess um, liquid in the intestines and cause bloating and gas. So it may be something as simple as that. But depending on how long you've had it, what your other health issues are, definitely start with the evaluation by your physician. What do you recommend for somebody who's thinking about transitioning to mostly plant-based, you know, like how do you jump right in, you know, or, or is it a gradual easing in, you know, how do you go about it to be most successful? That's a great question. I, I do recommend gradual. I mean, like any lifestyle change um, to be successful, you want to have a plan. First of all, you know, I recommend mindset, you know, kind of figuring out your why. Why, like you asked me, why do you want to go plant-based? Is it just because your friends are doing it or you saw it on TV and you think it's cool? The, the, when you can find your buy-in and your why, you're more likely to be successful, I think. Um, and then it can be a gradual thing. Uh, I talk about in my first book, Meal Masters, Your, your Simple Guide to Modern Day Meal Planning, I talk about how to shop and how to write a, a food list and things like that, a grocery list, because... By no means am I saying go clean out everything in your refrigerator and pantry and start over. No. But what you can do is as you're planning your meals, shop your pantry first, see what you've got at home first, and then gradually replace with more plant based. Pick a day of the week. You know, if you want to do a meatless Monday, if you say, you know what, mm -hmm. one day a week, I'm going to just eliminate meat. You don't even have to do a whole week. Um, but if you set a small goal for yourself, um, it can it can just be one meal out of a day, right? If you say for dinner, I'm not going to have any meat on Mondays. That's an accomplishment, right? If right. you've been eating meat all day, every day, and you sure. eliminated it in one meal, that's an accomplishment. So taking baby steps and recognizing those wins, um, I think are 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 key to a long term successful um, plan. Okay. Now we do have a couple of um, questions in the comment, and then also. Um, clarification on the podcast. Mm -hmm. So let's see. It says, I guess the real question is after you have had a workup and everything is good, but you want to be more plant based and find many plants create gas, uh, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, cantaloupe are all FODMAP triggers. 
Yes. So, and that that's a great question. And the issue comes down to there is really more, I think, the fiber. Because if you do, if you have, if you go from kind of zero to 60, you haven't been getting a lot of fiber, whether it's naturally in your diet or you're supplementing, you are going to get that bloating and feeling full and distended and so forth. So it, it would be a recommendation of, my recommendation would be to introduce things slowly. So, because a lot of Americans in this country do not get enough fiber. So if you all of a sudden start piling up your plate with all these fiber rich vegetables, while they're good for you, you have to give your body time to acclimate to that. So, you know, maybe start um, with smaller portion sizes and as your body becomes acclimated to it, increase the amount. Um, I've also I've also heard my mom is a, is a big proponent of ginger. She mm -hmm. said that adding ginger to some of these um, gassy type of, of vegetables can decrease decrease some of those those symptoms. So, uh, but yeah, I would say start low and go slow if you're introducing these um, these things for the first time. Okay, and then um, the clarification on FODMAP it says FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyoils, which are short chain carbohydrates that uh, the small intestine absorbs poorly. Yes, I agree. That's, I, I found that too. So thank you for, for adding that. So basically those can be, a, a, what that's saying is that those types of foods can be triggers for, for, for GI um, issues. So working with the dietitian and your doctor probably would be the best way to, to plan around that because um, the more complex the sugars and, and, and the, the carbohydrates um, may cause those symptoms. And so you want to have other alternatives to, to supplement or to replace that. Okay. And then um, they also say, so yes, you ease in with some of your favorite, easily tolerable vegetables. So I guess that's the a kind of a question. Is that what you do? Ease into the plant right. of eating with things that you tolerate easily? Exactly. And 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 also too, keep in mind the way you prepare something may help with symptoms as well. So, um, you know, frying or, or air frying rather, or baking something or um, steaming it, you know, may help um, as well. So, you know, playing around with different ways to prepare the food uh, could be helpful as well. So tell us, what are some of the health benefits? You mentioned your cholesterol. Um, but what are some of the health benefits of a plant-based diet? There are many, okay? And one thing I like to just tell people is eat the rainbow. So no, not the candy commercial, but eat the rainbow in that when you go into the grocery store and the produce is usually up front on the, you know, depending on your grocery store, it's going to be on the right or left side. The first thing I'm always struck by is just all of the colors, right? The reds, the yellows, the oranges, the greens, the purples, the blues, uh, even, you know, the white and brown. All those colors are made by plant chemicals. We call them phytonutrients. And those are healthy chemicals that are made by the plants, the sun, the earth, all of that. And they help to, uh, they're antioxidants and they're anti-inflammatories. And those are two big things in fighting and preventing disease. Specifically, antioxidants help to replenish or re repair damage to our body just from the day-to-day -day insults of living. We're exposed to ultraviolet sunlight, cigarette smoke, you know, pollution, uh, radiation, all of this stuff works at the molecular level to damage and destroy cells. And so when you have a diet that's rich in those antioxidants, it can help your body kind of repair itself better. And we know that that type of damage, that chronic inflammation, that underlying damage is the common denominator in a lot of chronic diseases, such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, even Alzheimer's disease. So eating those types of food, is kind of like I say, I call it investing in your plate, in your health, one plate at a time. Yeah. Know, because the more of those colors you can get on your plate, um, the better for you. Plus, you know, we eat with our eyes first and yeah. pretty food is, is intriguing, right? It's, it's enticing. So you want to um, just try to incorporate as many of those as you can day to day. So how soon after starting this kind of diet can you expect to see some of those health benefits? That's a great question. And again, I think working with your doctor, I think it depends on where you start. But I would say, you know, if you say if it's your cholesterol, something if you if your sugars are tending high or your cholesterol is, is uh, out of whack, it may be as soon as four to six weeks if you are actually 
adhering to the diet. Um, we usually say three months because it can be hard for people to get back in to get those labs done. But, um, you know, but it, it, studies have, have shown um, in, some, in some cases, depending on what they're testing, um, you know, days, it's like anti-inflammatory effects and things like that. But for the common blood test that we do, at least I'd say six to, to 12 weeks. Okay. There is a, another question in the chat. What is your favorite meat substitute? And then a question mark about Beyond Burger. I love that question because it, that reminds me to talk about uh, the the processed foods. Let me let me answer the question first. My favorite meat substitute is probably seitan. Seitan is it's called wheat meat. So it's basically it's a gluten product. So unfortunately, people with celiac or gluten issues would, you know, don't they don't eat this. But seitan is an option. Tofu is another option. Jackfruit, um, mushrooms, love mushrooms. Um, all of those are kind of my go to meat substitutes. Um, but the question about Beyond Burger, you know, from time to time, if I just want a big juicy burger, will I have a Beyond Burger? Sure. You know. Um, but remember, everything that's vegan is not necessarily healthy. Mm -hmm. So with the, the key thing, I, if I had to, to, to pick a label um, that I would focus on is really whole foods, because the least processed, the, more, the closer a food item is to its natural state, that's going to be the best for you. So, you know, I don't eat a lot of Beyond Burgers. Do I eat them? Yeah, sure. You know, if I'm out, um, you know, the restaurant has that on the menu. But I really enjoy places that make their burgers out of mushrooms and lentils and beans and things like that. Because uh, those are packed with fiber, packed with, packed with protein um, without the preservatives. Because if you look... Uh, if you compare Beyond Burger and some of those other meat substitutes with ground beef, they actually, while they don't have the cholesterol, they actually are loaded with sodium. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of saturated fat. And the long-term effects of those, uh, some of those additives are not known yet. So, you know, it's almost like, well, if you're going to eat a burger, just <laughs> eat a burger. <laughs> um, or one of these other, you know, more plant-based natural uh, meat substitutes. But great question. Sure. So now tell us about Physician in the Kitchen. Um, I know that's your, that's your baby. Um, I, I want to know more about what you do there and what your, and you told us some about your mission earlier, but what's your vision for, for the business? So my long-term vision is to is to create a brand that is sustainable, that is that is known in the market. Um, this year, I'm working to bring. I've created a vegan Worcestershire sauce, and I would like to get that on store shelves across the country. and And I'll I'll ask if I can. I'll ask your your listeners. Do who knows why Worcestershire sauce is not vegan? Does anybody know like what the ingredient is in Worcestershire sauce that makes it not vegan? So while they're thinking about that, um, okay. so basically what I did, I, I I went to the grocery store, I looked at the back of a bottle of one of the market leaders, copied, took a picture, came home and mixed up my version, uh, vegan version in my lab. I call my kitchen my lab. So my my vision is to one day have a whole suite of vegan. Uh, yes, anchovies. Great job. Great job. So Worcestershire sauce has anchovies, which are fish. And so my Worcestershire sauce is made without fish. And um, um, my my vision for my company, my brand is to um, to have a suite of, of vegan condiments and salad dressings. If I can get people just to make their own salad dressing, I'd be happy. Throw away that stuff that you buy at the store. Because once you make it at home and you see how easy it is and how flavorful it is, um, those are the kind of things I really enjoy is getting people to see how much power they have over food preparation. You know, it doesn't have to be this daunting, challenging thing and, you know, and it can be fun and all that. So as far as the business go, you know, be, that's being a, a lifestyle brand, um, a well-known food, um, advisor, you know, that's, that's my long-term goal and having some products out in the marketplace. Okay. So now you talk about um, the meals, not, you know, that it being better to prepare meals at home, but what about, you know, this, the watchers of this show are mostly professional women. We don't necessarily have time, you know, or feel like we don't have time. What do you have for us that would help us to, to better care for our families and, and give healthier meals, but, you know, being conscious of our time constraints? 
That's a great question. And yeah, and I, I believe me, I do realize that not everybody has the leisure time or desire to, to make things from scratch or do it at home. So in that case, what I recommend is, it, it, first of all, I'd make it a family, um, you know, a, event. Uh, as women, sometimes we feel we have to do everything. And if you have little ones, I mean, this can start as young as, you know, preschoolers. When you go grocery shopping, let them help you put away some of their snacks or label their snacks so that they can, um, you know, help kind of know where things go in the pantry and kind of start to outsource some of that because you're also teaching them how to become independent as well so that everything is not on you. But setting aside some time during the week to maybe meal prep. And again, this can be a family event, but just say, you know what, maybe one or two days this week, we're going to meal prep. We're going to have a meal that we cooked at home uh, versus something on the run or take out or deliver. And for those times that you do have to have things delivered uh, delivered or eat at a restaurant, just make wise choices. I mean, you know, you want to know um, kind of what words to look for in the menu. You know, if something is battered or fried or glazed, you know, those are kind of some of those buzzwords that really mean calories, right? right, right, right. Uh, versus things that are baked or grilled or air fried. So being able to make smart choices when you do have to um, rely on someone else to prepare your food, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But, what, you know, we, we find time for what's important. And so uh, maybe looking and really make, making a time budget, you know, say, okay, look, on this day, we're going to do, we're going to prep two meals this week. Uh, again, small steps to start somewhere. And then also prep foods that can be repurposed. You know, if you are eating chicken, let's just say, um, you know, you can repurpose it. And so it can be salad in one day, it can be tacos another day. It can be, you know, and the same thing with tofu, whatever your meat substitute is, but just um, have options so that you're, you're making a big batch of something, but you have um, diverse ways to use it so that you don't get bored or tired of, of the food that you've, that you've prepped. Okay, so now the so you have a cookbook, right? Um, it's right here. There it is. <laughs> Doc, fix my plate. Um, so, so what is what would you say the average prep time for some of those recipes might be? That's a great question, and I would say no more than thirty minutes, like from from you know prep to cooking. Um, like the, some of the stuff where you might have to bake, of course, may take a little longer. But um, having your your mise en place, which is the fancy term I learned in culinary school, which is everything in its place. So having everything prepped and ready to go. Um, so if that means dice your onions, slice your celery, um, you know, wash your beans, have everything ready to go, and then as you assemble it, it'll go much faster. Um, that's key as opposed to kind of just pulling stuff and you're like, oh, wait, I need this. Oh, wait, I need that. Yeah, yeah. You know, look over the recipe first, see what needs to be, how, you know, how long does your oven need to preheat? Things like that will really help. Uh, but yeah, these are meant to be um, quick and easy. Um, you know, the, I, I try to limit the number of ingredients because that can be a little nerve wracking to people. Uh, I think one of the more complex one might be the vegan butter chicken because you do have mm -hmm. to um, make your, your marinade for your tofu. I'm sorry. Well, you can use tofu, but I use king oyster mushrooms. So it's, it's got some steps to it, but, um, in my opinion, it's, it's worth the payoff. <laughs> so, yeah. so what, so you, so tell us about some of the common substitutes that you've come up with, because you talked about that, um, you know, being able, you talked about your grandmother and some of the things that she made, what kind of substitutes are you, and I'm, and I'm making an assumption, um, but I'm assuming that a lot of her food was what we would call soul food. Oh, and you so, know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so what kind of substitutions do you recommend for those who, who, you know, enjoy a soul food diet, but want to be healthier? Yes. Great question. One of my favorite things I like to talk about is spices, spices and herbs. I, I think that we don't always recognize the, the importance um, in seasoning that they play. You know, people reach for the salt shaker, but um, you can get a lot of good flavor from just some fresh herbs, some spices. Uh, one of my favorite things to use is liquid smoke in my collard greens, you know, as opposed to that fat pack that you might use or smoked turkey, you can get some liquid smoke, some smoked paprika, and that will really elevate your, your collard greens, a little bit of acid, a little bit of a, you know, vinegar with that. So, um, I think as far as substitutes go, like I, 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 I bake. And so a couple of the recipes in the book are, are cakes, vegan, um, and gluten-free cakes. 
baking desserts is like chemistry. And so you got to have the right proportions and stuff. So it was a lot of trial and error. Um, and you have to also kind of understand what role like eggs play in in it. Because eggs can add moisture, they can add taste, they can add, um, you know, uh, structure. So knowing what you're using the egg for will kind of help you uh, determine how to substitute. But things like applesauce, you know, some of my recipes use applesauce instead of eggs. You can use uh, aquafaba, which is the, the juice from a can of chickpeas. Mm-hmm. That makes up into a nice meringue. I mean, it's a lots of different things you can you can use. Flaxseed is a big one for me when I'm looking for a binder instead of an egg uh, for like my faux crab cakes. Uh, flaxseed. So you're getting the healthy omega-3, the fiber from the flaxseed, you know, in place of an egg. So, uh, and then the plant milks that I'm in love with, like I'm just um, with like oat milk and and almond milk. And actually the ones I make myself, I have a a, a milk making machine um, that you just add a couple of ingredients to, and then you've got your own preservative free milk. So, I mean, it, it was just, I could go on and on, but those are some of my favorites. Wonderful. So now do you do um, cooking lessons? I do. I do. I have a subscription uh, service. It's called Cooking with Dr. Monique. You, we, we meet in the kitchen virtually. Uh, it can be live. It can be on demand. But um, what I do is I send the recipes, uh, the ingredients, the recipe uh, out You know, beforehand. We meet at a, at, a, at a certain time. And it's really important that you come to the class with everything kind of prepped. Because again, you know, we're meeting to cook and put everything together. But yeah, I, I, I enjoy doing that. I do cooking classes for groups um, as well everyone just kind of meets up in zoom and we we have fun in the kitchen oh wonderful so now um we're almost out of time but if someone's interested in working with you if they're interested in getting your books tell us tell us where we can find you where we can find all the good stuff so I'm on all social media at Physician in the Kitchen. So you can always drop me a line there if you forget everything else I've said. At Physician in the Kitchen works on all social media, even TikTok. I have an amazing social media manager. And she's got me on TikTok. Um, so uh, I actually have Nutter. I'm a brand affiliate for Nutter, N-U-T-R. And uh, I actually have a discount code, Physician in the Kitchen. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. P-I-T-K-10 is the discount code um, for, for Nutter. Uh, but Almond Cow is, is a good one, too. Um, but if you wanted to um, join me virtually in the kitchen, it's cookingwithdrmonique.com. And the book, Doc Fix Your Plate, Doc Fix My Plate, is docfixmyplatebook.com. And that that you get that directly from me. Um, it's, so, it's for sale on Amazon, but I prefer for people buy it for me and that's how you get the autographed copy yes okay so i'd like to end um all of my lives with a variation on the same question and so i will ask you if there's someone who's looking to up level their diet what is the single best action they can take oh single best because I, I can i can i cheat and do two okay <laughs> Sure, why not? <laughs> one and a half. Number it's one, I really, go for it. Okay, because I want to say I just do, I do want to say a word about hydrate. I want to say a word about drinking enough water. Because I think that's something that people tend to forget. And we sometimes misinterpret thirst for, uh, for hunger. So we think we're hungry and we reach for something to eat versus stopping and drinking about eight ounces of water and seeing how we feel. So water, water, water everywhere. But I guess I would say the single best thing you could do to change your diet is, I would just say baby steps. I would say take baby steps and show yourself some grace. Whether it's whether you go completely plant-based or you're doing two or three days a week, whatever you decide to do, uh, realize that it's trial and error. It's a journey. You know, I've been on it now almost three years. I'm still learning and discovering things. Uh, don't think that you have to have all the answers the first day because that's not realistic. And that's going to likely set you up for disappointment and, you know, all this negative stinking thinking and all that. So I would say before I even get into the food itself, um, be intentional, you know, have have a plan. Anything you want to do successfully, you, you should probably have a plan and uh, and then show yourself some grace and the rest will fall into, into line, into place. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Monique. This has been so informative. Um, we've had lots of engagement in the chat. You have some accolades here. Um, so pretty, nice cover, great job, fantastic work. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your, for what you do. First. Thank you. First thank, you. Oh, thank you for what you do. 
And then also thank you for coming to share with us this evening. My pleasure. So guys, if you're looking to up-level your diet, you want to become plant-based, seek out Dr. Monique. Definitely get a copy of her book. Hold it up again, Dr. Monique. There we go. Dot fix my plate. Look how beautiful. Look at the rainbow. She's encouraging us to eat the rainbow. <laughs> so wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all so much. We will see you next week. Take care. Bye.